Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for joining us on the special occasion of President Gregory Floyd receiving the World Peace Prize Roving Ambassador for Peace Award. I'm Barbara Flaherty. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Irish National Caucus and a Judge and Corporate Manager of the World Peace Prize. And before we begin, I would like to give special thanks to Phyllis, who has been our godsend in organizing, to Anthony, our Chief IT, Anthony Madrano, and Alex Garrett. Without their assistance, this would not roll. President Sean M. O'Brien lauded the choice of President Ford for the World Peace Prize, saying, I want to congratulate Greg for receiving this award. We applaud this organization, the World Peace Prize and the Irish Peace Foundation, mission of connecting labor's fight for justice with the fight for justice on many other fronts. Greg has been fighting on behalf of working men and women his entire life. President Gregory Floyd. And thank you for being patient during this. Right, um, at this point, I would like to do a very brief introduction of Father Sean McManus. Father McManus came to America in October 1972, and since then he has incessantly worked for peace and justice in Northern Ireland. In 1974, he founded the Irish National Caucus, and in the words of former New York Congressman Ben Gilman, and I'm sure some of you remember Ben, uh, he was a chairman of the House International Relations Committee. Ben said, no one has done more than Father McManus to keep the U.S. Congress on track regarding justice and peace in Northern Ireland. On February 5th, 1984, Father McManus launched one of the caucus's in signature initiatives, the McBride Principles, a corporate code of conduct for American companies doing business in Northern Ireland. And it's very appropriate to tell this audience of labor leaders and labor friends that the first group that endorsed the McBride principles was the AFL-CIO, and that was something that everybody was very proud of at the time. In addition to all his peace and justice work, Father Sean has authored several books, and My American Struggle for Justice in Northern Ireland, and the update edition of 2019 tells about the struggle to get Congress to pay attention to the situation in Northern Ireland. So, ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to help me welcome Father Sean McManus. Thank you, Barbara. God bless the Teamsters. I know you're not all Teamsters, but God bless you all anyway. Uh, and God bless our brand new roving ambassador for peace himself sitting right here. Special word of thanks to Phyllis. Phyllis, we know that a lot of this wouldn't have happened <coughs> without you. So, thank you. Let me tell you a little bit, a wee bit, about the World Peace Prize. Barbara mentioned Dr. Han Min Soon, a Presbyterian minister living, born and reared in South Korea. And he had a vision back in 89 uh, an awareness that he ought to do something regarding peace. And his idea, because there were already huge, big, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize and all of that, all of it very good. His idea was to reach out not just to famous international figures, presidents of the United States, major, major world leaders, but what about the people who are building peace all the time? Not just for six weeks or a year, or, and then they get the Nobel Peace Prize. And there's a role for that, an important role for that. What about the people who are at it all the time, all across the world? People like yourselves, people like this man here. 
and he put together an international interfaith council that would pick potential winners of the Peace Prize. And on that council would be representatives of all the major religions in the world. You know them all. Judaism, Catholicism, Protestantism, uh, Islam in the 6th century. Um, and nine of them all together, including the, the very ancient Eastern religions. And it was a novel idea. Um, and Dr. Han had become familiar with our work over the years. And he was a very perfect pers persuasive man. And he relentlessly lobbied us to join his organization and help him. And at that time, he needed more of a presence in Washington, D.C. So he pleaded with us to become involved. We were already admirers of his work. So eventually we conceded to him because he was a most persistent man. And I knew he would keep at us if we didn't relent and join him. So I said, I surrender. We'll join. We'll join up. Barbara and I travelled in 2013 to South Korea and were sworn in as judges on this panel that would pick potential winners of the prize. And while there, I was, se was selected as the chief judge. And when we assumed these responsibilities, <clears throat> we set out to establish two principles. One, that when we talk about peace, we're really talking about justice. Everybody can talk about peace. Every great oppressor in world history wanted peace <laughs> on their terms, while the slaves or the oppressed people had to <coughs> live their lot. So justice was going to be, if we were to be involved, the heart and soul of the struggle for peace. Because the only way any of us can work for peace is, in effect, to work for justice. Now, we can pray for peace, and we all ought to pray for peace, but the way to work for it is to work for justice. There is no other way, and that's our work on this earth. We do justice, we work for justice. And then the second objective was to firmly place the American labor movement, because of my experience over the years with labor, in the category of those who should be considered for, for the prize. And that took a while for the interfaith board to fully grasp because they had different ideas of labor movements in different parts of the world. So, but we persisted and uh, they quite quickly, in the end, got it. Now, what is the intrinsic connection anywhere between faith and justice? Why would a religious group of nine religious representatives single out justice? What's that about? What's the connection between faith, religion and justice? Sort of surprising that we have to even <coughs> make that point because there is an absolute intrinsic connection so much so that if there is no justice on this earth, there is no faith on this earth. And that's not just me saying it. Let me give you a few examples. And I, as you'll see as we continue here, these, this is applicable to people of faith and people of no faith and we all know people 
of no faith. But we know also that people of no faith can be people of goodwill. So our point in all of this is that this pertains and applies to people of faith and people of goodwill, whether they're believers or not. Let me give you a few examples. Here's how we make the connection. It's very easy to make. I want to give you a quote by a famous biblical expert of the Old Testament, a Protestant minister by the name of Walter Brueggemann, an American. He says with startling clarity, you don't have to be a biblical expert or exegete to get this. It's remarkably clear. He says, in biblical faith, the doing of justice is the primary expectation of God. Whoa! In biblical faith, all faiths, in biblical faith, the doing of justice is the primary expectation of God. To me, that's a startling, simple expression. Imagine the different world we'd be in if all believers actually believed that and everyone practiced it. The great prophet Isaiah, who lived around 740 BC, in a wonderful verse tells us that God declared I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet. That may <laughs> need some explanation, especially for younger folk. Um, older folk will remember this, that the plummet was a little weight, usually with a pointed tip which when suspended by a string, a simple string, becomes the plummet line. The plummet line. A pretty good way of ensuring that something is plumb. In other words, straight. And you know, if you're going to be building something, <laughs> it's important that it goes up in a straight line. So here's, here's the powerful message here that God is saying while others may have all sorts of measurements all sorts of criteria for conduct and what should be done and how to judge action God has one criterion he uses justice the line and righteousness the plummet there's no escaping from this logic here. The justice and belief in God, one and the same thing, one and the same thing. A quote from an Islamic scholar. Standing firm for justice is considered close to, closest to godliness. In other words, my Islamic religious and social responsibility is to work, to work for just causes. In my Islamic faith, I am required to stand witness to justice, fairness and equality not just in words, but in practice. That could be written by any labor leader. And we all know that blessed Martin Luther King, I call him blessed Martin Luther King Jr., loved to quote the prophet Amos, one of the earliest prophets in the Old Testament. And one of his famous quotes in the Old Testament was, let justice roll down like water and righteousness 
like a never flowing stream. So, friends, I've quoted an American Protestant scripture scholar, an Islamic scholar, I've quoted the Bible and quoted Martin, in effect, Martin Luther King Jr. So I guess I better come up with a Catholic source and a quote, otherwise the Catholics might come and pick at this building <laughs> <laughs> and blame you, President Floyd, for that. And I have a terrific quote for you. Listen carefully to this now from a group of what seemed to be a conservative church. In 1971, the bishops from all the, the world met in Rome to address the issue of justice. And they were from America, Latinos, Eastern, Africans, all over the world. And I emphasize that because that shows the influence here of the third world countries and the Latino and its emphasis on liberation. Here's the statement. Action on behalf of justice and participation in the transformation of the world fully appear to us as a constitutive dimension of the church's mission for the redemption of the human race and its liberation from every oppressive situation. A constitutive dimension of preaching the gospel. Constitutive without which something does not stand. So what the bishops are saying there is like all the other quotes. If justice is not part of the equation, there is no gospel. <coughs> there is no gospel. Uh, so, folks, as Joe Biden says all the time, <laughs> folks, friends, uh, people of faith believe we are here on earth to worship God and to do his will and build up the kingdom of God on this earth in solidarity, in respect for every son and daughter of God, to build up the beloved community preached by Martin Luther King. And as mentioned, not only that, but people of no faith and no religion, but of goodwill, can agree in principle with all of this. So when we zero in on justice, we do something quite wonderful. We rope in people of faith and people of no faith, but of goodwill. Every person who does not believe, but who has goodwill towards the common good and to his brothers and sisters here and the world over, every such person like that would agree totally with the essence and the principle of all this that I'm speaking about. Martin Luther King taught us that peace is the result of justice and Pope John Paul, Saint John Paul, tells us peace is the fruit of solidarity. Peace is the fruit of solidarity. The Pope stole your battle cry and raised it up as a virtue. <laughs> Think of that one. <coughs> Think of that one. So the point in all of this is that it was very easy, President Floyd, for us to make the connection between World Peace Prize and labor 
the people of labor and to zero in on leaders among the labor movement who'd represent their own people. Faith is the faith that does justice. Faith is the faith that does justice on earth. If it does not do justice, it's not faith. If someone tells you, as St. John the Evangelist in his Gospel says, the person who says he loves God but hates people is a liar and the truth is not in him. So isn't it amazing how so many of us in the world separated in an extraordinary way? You know, oh, the God, God's up here, people are over there. Well, I'm not all that interested in people, I'm only interested in God. God says, get out of here, because the only way you can prove you love me is by loving people. And not just in a sentimental way, but the only way you can prove you love me is build up this earth in justice, equality, respect, and fairness. That is what the World Peace Prize, that's what our mission is, to do that. And as you can see with the little clip from uh, President Trump, uh, God rest him, he got, we went, when we got back from Korea, we went to see him and he immediately, he immediately got it. Sharp as a whip. Uh, he said, what can I do to help? I want to be involved, immediately. And actually, what I got off when I first spoke to Phyllis, and I got off the phone, I said to Barbara, Phyllis gets it, she just got it like that. As you see, Sean O'Brien got it. Like Trumpka, he got the connection immediately. One, one didn't have to prove it to him, he, he got it. And that's what we, and then when I spoke to the president here himself, it was so apparent that, that you got it. And that is wonderful to see because we just are not interested in um, giving out presentations, but seeing that the people who get fully understand, because that's how the message is spread, by people who understand this I used to say, uh, tell older labor leaders back in the early 50 years ago here that they were almost like people with a religious vocation, you know, a call to the religious life or something, because the, all of them had that. They didn't go around speaking about it, but all of them in their own self felt they were called to do this work, to do the work of labor in justice and peace. Uh, and that's what grabbed me uh, by the, 50 years ago by the labor. They the, the had this motivation. And our World Peace Prize focuses on that. And that's our mission to spread that word because we think it's a powerful message for labor. And we urge all labor people to seize it, just like Trumpka said to do to make this connection. If you want to believe in God, <laughs> you better prove it. You better prove it by doing justice. Because if you're not doing justice, your prayers are meaningless to God. And that's a constant theme right through the new, Old and New Testament. It, it's a constant theme. The faith is the faith that does justice. That tells you a little bit about the World Peace Prize. It also, I hope, tells you why this man was chosen to be an ideal exemplar for the World Peace Prize 
of roving ambassador for peace. God bless you, Gregory. God bless you all. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, in a moment we're going to have the investiture, but I'd like to show you what Greg is going to receive. The second item he will receive is his World Peace Prize medal. <clears throat> it says World Peace Prize on it. The um, first thing he will receive is this plaque. And I will read the plaque to you. World, World Peace Prize Roving Ambassador for Peace. Gregory Floyd, President Teamsters Local 237 and Vice President at Large, 2022. For a lifetime of dedication to justice. For realizing that without justice, there is no love. For knowing that world peace is the fruit of solidarity and for having the solidarity to live by these principles. President Floyd, would you please come up? To the side. Yeah, well, otherwise it won't be on. This is been, okay. Um, congratulations, Gregory. Thank you. Um, uh, perhaps you want to stand yeah. over here in front okay. of the podium. We'll get a better because shot. Other, well, Real photographers, right? Huh? Watch yeah. the corner. Yeah. 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 Well, anyway. okay. I'm practicing. <laughs> Thank you, though. I'm very clumsy on top of the room. Okay. Do you guys want to see Yeah, no, no, you're fine. Just look over here, please. Thank you. Okay. Let me just angle this way. And stand there just here, Father Sean. Oh, you got it. Okay. I showed everybody the middle. Okay, stand, stand there, I guess. Okay. Um, And again, congratulations. Ambassador Thank Floyd. You. Roving oh, Ambassador. Yeah. Now. Wow, this is uh, such a prestigious honor to receive an award inspired by leaders in social and labor justice like Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka is humbling. Labor and justice and social justice are forever intertwined. You can't have one without the other. Equality, respect, and compassion are not only workplace goals, but should be everyday goals of humanity. Dr. King perhaps expressed it best when he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere and our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. It is the mission of the World Peace Foundation to not remain silent in the face of threats to justice and peace. And it's the mission of labor unions like Teamsters 237 not to be silent either. To help ease struggles of hardworking men and women in honor of in and of itself and to receive an award for that effort lets all people and especially those of us in the labor movement 
know that our efforts are recognized and valued. Thank you, Father McManus, for this honor and for the work your dynamic organization does. I remember that as a trustee of NICES, we supported the New York City Controller at the time, Bill Thompson, and his work on the McBride principles, which set corporate goals to conduct um, for the conduct of American companies doing business in Northern Ireland that launched the National Caucus on November 5th, 1984. The principles were passed into New York City law, state law, and federal law. The McBride principles are now regarded as the most successful campaign ever against anti-Catholic discrimination in employment. Once again, I'd like to thank Father McManus and Barbara Flaherty for your work and all that you do. And I thank you for this honor. And I also want to give um, some context to how I was told I was being recommended for this award. Richard Trumka recommended me for this award. But when I got the call from Father McManus, I said, he, Richard Trumka could not have recommended me for this award because he had since passed. But Father McManus began to tell me that Richard Trumka spoke very highly of me. And I said, I only met Richard Trumka one time. And I spoke to him maybe twice since then. In August of 2000, actually it was June 2001, I was assigned to pick up Richard Trumka from the Philadelphia airport. We had a conference in Atlantic City. And I drew the short store. So <laughs> I had to pick up Richard Trumka, which was about an hour and a half, two hours away from where we were. So when I drove to the airport and I picked up Mr. Trumka, President Trumka, he was the secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO at the time. Neither one of us knew the trajectory of our careers. So he got in the car and we began to have a conversation. I said, what am I going to say to this man? I don't know him. He doesn't know me. But we found common goal. We spoke about Penn State. <laughs> where he was a trustee and he went to Penn State. And my father-in-law was from Reading, Pennsylvania and he loved Penn State because his best friend in high school was an All-American at Penn State, Lenny Moore. They were high school buddies. So when we began to talk about how many people we knew from Penn State, and then we started talking about the labor movement. And then he's talking about his, he, he was injured as a football player, but he had two classmates Lydell Mitchell, who was a running back in the NFL, and Franco Harris, who was a running back and uh, four-time um, Super Bowl winner for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So he told me how much he loved those two guys because they bought Park Sausage Plant and put people back to work. So I'm like, okay, we're, we're about halfway through our uh, ride with conversation. And then he began to and tell me, I told him a story that my father-in-law had never been to a Penn State game. He said, well, we're going to make that happen. So he said, you called me and gave me his number and I will make sure that you are able to take your father-in-law to a Penn State game. I said, wow, I'm going to be a real hero. My father-in-law never went to Penn State. <laughs> and I am going to be the one to take him to a Penn State game. So at the time, in the last, I would say, 75 years, there were only two coaches at Penn State. One was Rip Engel, who probably was there about 40 years. And at the time, it was, Joe Paterno was the coach, and he was there for about 50 years. So that's a lot for a great institution to only have two coaches in, in 75 years. So after that, it was 9-11 happened and the world changed as we knew it. But President Trucker, 
secretary treasurer at the time kept his promise. He gave us the tickets. We went to see Penn State play Michigan. Big game. 100,000 people. So we go in, and I said, man, Penn State must have this big place. We go down the street. It was like going through somebody's yard. We go into this big area where the school was. We saw the game. Penn State lost 20 to nothing. <laughs> it wasn't one of the highlights of their career. <laughs> but the experience was coming out. It took us three hours to get out of the parking lot because that driveway, that street that we went down, all the cars had to get out. And it took us the three hours to get out, almost longer to get out of the parking lot than it did to drive back to Reading, Pennsylvania from Happy Valley. <laughs> and I said, you know, this was a great experience, but I could never come to another Penn State game. <laughs> <laughs> but I thank uh, President Trumpka for the tickets. And every time somebody met with him that knew me, they said he would always speak highly of you. And I said, impossible. These guys are lying to me. <laughs> President Trumpka doesn't know me. <laughs> and it wasn't until I got the call from Father McManus that I really actually knew it was true. And I'm just sorry that he didn't live for me to say thank you for the honor, but you just never know how life is. And my dad always told me, and I and continue to say this, always do your job because you never know who's watching you. And I just want to say thank you and thank you all to my friends for coming out and it's such a great honor, and I'll never forget this moment. Thank you. Thank you, President Floyd, Ambassador Floyd. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, this really ends our ceremony. And I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and join us in honoring President Floyd, Ambassador Floyd now. And I want to tell you what a joy it has been for Father McManus and for me to come to New York. I spent a lot of my time in New York as a kid. I'm a Jersey girl and I used to go to see the Bronx Bombers play. Now I won't tell you how old I am. For those of you in the know, when I would go, there was a number seven in center field, a, a number nine in right, and a number eight, my godfather, behind the plate. So um, I am thrilled to be back here and thank you very much and please continue to enjoy the refreshments. God bless you all. Thank you.